Hello, everyone. I am uh, just going to let people trickle in, our attendees, make sure everyone gets in from the waiting room. Welcome to our final uh, webinar of the year, which is uh, a hugely topical one, uh, uh, always, but it was really at the forefront of uh, a lot of our minds and, and uh, societal discourse this year. So I'm really glad to have Rebecca with us today to talk on it. All right. Okay, we'll let some more people trickle in, but let me uh, get this started because I know there's a lot to cover. First of all, uh, my name is Jean-Paul Bevilacqua. I'm a lawyer and a program developer here at OGEN. Um, really uh, happy to have uh, Rebecca here uh, today to speak on uh, refugee protection in Canada. Uh, first though, uh, as I uh, acknowledge that uh, our audience is coming from all over the province. Um, I myself am conducting this webinar from uh, the city of Toronto, which is on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I also want to acknowledge that uh, Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty is signed with multiple, multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. And uh, as I was thinking about the topic today, I was mindful of the final two calls to action uh, from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, calls number 93 and 94, that deal specifically with newcomers to Canada, uh, and call 93, which deals with uh, uh, more uh, reflective citizenship tests and information kit for newcomers um, to include uh, the history of diverse Indigenous people, uh, peoples of Canada, uh, including information about the treaties and history of residential schools. Uh, that is currently in progress, uh, according to the federal government's website. A more uh, positive final outcome comes with Paul 94 that was related to the oath of citizenship. And uh, last year, there was an act to amend this uh, citizenship act to insert new language uh, that refers to uh, indigenous and treaty rights of First Nations, uh, Inuits and Métis people. Um, with that, let me welcome our uh, speaker. And just on a personal note, uh, I was telling my, my colleagues earlier on, but it's a real treat to have Rebecca with us today. Uh, because uh, for many reasons, her expertise and experience, of course, top of list, but also uh, we went to high school together, so we've known each other for, for a couple decades now. It's a real, um, real special thing to be able to come back uh, in this forum uh, and learn from her today. So Rebecca Laux is an immigration refugee lawyer in Toronto. She has regularly appeared before the Immigration Refugee Board, the federal court since being called to the bar in 2014. Uh, prior to just actually starting her own firm earlier this fall in 2022, she worked at two internationally renowned refugee law firms in Toronto, as well as the UN Refugee Agency in Honduras. She has previously taught the refugee protection course for the University of British Columbia's Certificate in Immigration, um, and just uh, got news recently that uh, she will be teaching a similar course uh, at Queen's, which is fantastic. And um, before we get into her presentation, just a couple of housekeeping reminders. This webinar is recorded uh, for future use in your classrooms. Um, our wide array of webinars are now uploaded to our archive and the link will be put to that by my colleague Raras in the chat. Um, so please do look, we've had a fantastic program uh, this year um, covering a huge spectrum of legal topics, issues, uh, and thorny subjects. Um, so it's been really interesting. And um, please feel free to use the chat and Q&A function throughout this presentation. I will be fielding questions and asking them to Rebecca throughout. And uh, with that, let me pass it over and uh, give a warm welcome to Rebecca Lux. Great, thank you, Jean-Paul. and. Um... Yeah, I'm going to try to leave some questions uh, for the some time for the end for questions as well. But as Jean-Paul said, feel free to ask anything. And also, um, 
you know, feel free, Jean-Paul, to tell me if I need to slow down because sometimes I, I get a little too, too fast and, and I forgot to write out my normal sticky note that I stick on the computer that says speak slowly. So I, I might need you to help me with that. Um, but I'm really happy to be here. So why don't we get started? Um, so here's a very basic outline of what I'll be going over this afternoon. I will walk you through the legal definitions for convention refugee and person in need of protection, which are two ways that a person can get Canada's protection. Um, and then uh, later in my presentation, I'm going to introduce a third way that I'll be hiding from you in, in the beginning of the presentation. Um, I'll talk about the various processes for obtaining these statuses, whether in Canada or outside of Canada. I will briefly address remedies available to people who do not qualify for protection. And then finally, I'm going to examine Canada's evolving um, response to recent humanitarian crises, including the Syrian conflict, the conflict in Ukraine, and the, the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan. So Canada's refugee system is the result of being a signatory to the United Nations 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees and the 1967 protocol. It's the key legal document that forms the basis of the UN refugee agency's work. It's been ratified by I think 149 state parties now, including Canada. It defines the term refugee and outlines the rights of the displaced as well as the legal obligations of state parties to protect them. It was drafted in 1951 as a reaction to World War II, which saw millions di displaced. But after World War II, other refugee situations arose that did not meet the definition set out in the convention because that definition had some temporal and geographical uh, restrictions. So the 1967 protocol addressed these protection gaps and Canada acceded to both the convention and the protocol in 1969. Domestically, we have the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. And um, here I have included some of the objectives of the act. Obviously not all of them are included here. There are many others relating to national security, family reunification, program integrity, et cetera. Um, the ones here, however, are the important ones that form the basis of Canada's refugee system. First, a uh, recognition that refugee protection is first and foremost about uh, saving lives and offering pro uh, protection. And then secondly, of course, Canada's understanding Canada's international legal obligations and affirming Canada's commitment to them like the obligations under the, the UN Convention. So to obtain refugee status in Canada, a person must either be a convention refugee or a person in need of protection. So convention refugee, the definition is outlined at section 96 of our act and person in need of protection at section 97. Here's uh, the legal definition for section uh, 96, convention refugee. You'll see it's a bit of a mouthful. So what I've done is I've drawn out the key elements of the definition here. Um, and I'll, I'll walk through them one by one. So first, the person has to be outside of their country of nationality or uh, outside of their country of former habitual residence in the case of people that are stateless. Um, so this is you know, a very key part of the, the definition that a lot of people unfortunately don't understand. And even just the other day, I, I received um, a call from, from an LGBTQ person in Pakistan asking me how he can access Canada's refugee system, but that option is not really available to him right now, as long as he remains in Pakistan, unfortunately. Um, the next part of the definition is that the person has to have a well-founded fear of persecution. Uh, there's no set definition for persecution, but it's generally accepted to mean a serious violation of one's physical and or psychological integrity. So physical violence, um, threats of physical violence will generally be considered persecutory. Um, discrimination is generally not considered to be persecution, but cumulative discrimination uh, taken together if it's bad enough, can rise to the level of, of persecution. So where in, in our area of law, where we'll see this argument come up a lot might be with 
refugee claims made by the Roma community from certain European countries, for instance. So the argument in those claims is whether the cumulative discrimination they face constitutes persecution. And then you'll see there, before the word persecution, there's this language, well-founded fear. The courts have determined that this language has both an objective and a subjective basis, meaning subjectively, a person has to genuinely be afraid, but that there also has to be an objective basis for them to hold that genuine fear. So when assessing subjective fear, a decision maker will look at maybe you know, any actions that the person took that seem contrary to someone who was truly afraid. So did they delay leaving their country after a persecutory event? Well, what was their explanation for the delay? Maybe it took them a while to get a passport and, and the necessary funds. Did they travel through a third country on their way to Canada? And that third country is generally a safe country for refugees such that we would expect they'd make a refugee claim there. Um, if they didn't, why not? Maybe they had family members in Canada that they wanted to reunite with. Um, did they delay making a claim when they got to Canada? Um, generally, any failure to claim at the port of entry, the, at the airport or at the land border, even if you make a refugee claim a week later, it's still technically a delay. They probably won't make that big a deal about a week, but some people, you know, might live out of status in Canada for a couple of years before making their claim. And so there'll be lots of questions about that from the decision maker and, and whether someone left their country and then returned to their country, particularly if that return happened after a persecutory event, that too is something that would maybe cause the decision maker to question whether they have uh, subjective fear. And then for the objective basis, it's really just about looking at their evidence. Um, and does the evidence establish the allegations they've set out that they meet a certain profile, for instance, and that that profile would be at risk in their home country? Rebecca, yeah. I have a question here. Um, with the understanding that it's you know a decision maker assessing these two uh, bases of fear, how much do you as a legal professional have to have uh, an assessment capability on your end to decide whether or not to take a client on? Um, you know, I, t I tend not to take a client on if I, if I doubt, I think that their claim is just, you know, just to buy themselves some time in the country. Um, if they have a, most of the time, someone might have a genuine fear, um, but I'm not quite sure about the objective basis, or I might, you know, tell them, um, what you're telling me about is, um, discrimination, it might not be found to rise to the level of persecution. But I mean, I'll still, I'll still take on their case, but I just have to advise them up front of what their chances are. But if it's something that I feel is just actually fraudulent, then, then I wouldn't do it. And that line between discrimination and persecution, do you find that that's easily understood? No, no, I think it, it really depends on the client. Um, you know, some clients are far more sophisticated than others. And, 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 um, and then there's other people who, who really think that they have to have been persecuted in the past to have uh, a basis for a refugee claim. I just had a consultation with a gay man from Turkey the other day, and he said he had already spoken with another lawyer, apparently, who told him he had... Um, because he's, you know, so successfully hidden his sexual orientation back home and never had any problems that he probably wouldn't be successful in his claim. And I said, well, that's, that's just <laughs> not the case. But yeah, there are a lot of misconceptions out there, unfortunately, but um, uh, understanding discrimination versus persecution is always a, is a tough conversation with, with clients as well to, to make that distinction. Yeah, I get that. Thank you. No problem. Um, so the next part of the test is that the risk of persecution has to be connected to one of the five grounds that are listed in the convention. We call this a nexus to the convention. Um, so the five grounds listed in the convention are race, religion, nationality, political opinion, and membership in a particular social group. Um, membership in a particular social group is the most malleable of the grounds. This is where the case law has developed part, uh, certain social groups that will fall into this category. So 
Um, victims of domestic violence or other gender-based violence will fall under this category. Um, sex claims based on sexual orientation and gender identity will fall under that category as well. The next part of the test is that state protection is not available. So this means either the state is unwilling or unable to protect the person, perhaps because the state is the agent of persecution, um, or in cases where the person, the agent of persecution is not the state, but say an individual or a group, uh, it can be a bit trickier to rebut the presumption that the state will protect you. Um, but, you know, in some situations, it might be that the state's not willing, like maybe in cases of domestic or gender violence in a certain country, the police might just say, that's a family problem, we don't interfere with that. Um, or maybe the state just doesn't have the resources to do anything to help. This too gets a little bit tricky because no state's government can provide perfect protection, even Canadian police can't. The test comes down to whether they can provide adequate protection. Um, and efforts by the police are not enough. It has to be based on on the ground realities of what the police in that country are actually able to do. The next part of the test is that there has to be no location in the country where the person could live safely. We call this internal flight alternative. So where the state is the agent of persecution and the state has control over the entire territory of the country, then obviously there's not gonna be any viable um, internal flight alternative for that person. But in cases where the agent of persecution is a non-state actor, and particularly where it's a big country, the decision maker is going to look at whether there are other places in that country that the refugee claimant could live safely. So for instance, if we have, let's think of a claim made by an aid worker who was targeted by the Taliban in Peshawar, Pakistan, the decision maker might say, why can't you go live safely in Hyderabad, for instance? Or, you know, think of a Sikh woman um, fleeing an honor killing um, in Punjab, in India. The decision maker might say, why can't you go, like, how would your family be able to find you in Chennai in the South? So these are the kinds of questions that come up in, in claims where the state's not the agent of persecution and, and there's there, the claimant's coming from a larger country. Um, so the decision maker will look at the motivation of the agents of persecution to actually you know, travel those vast dif distances to harm the person, but also the means of the agent of persecution to actually be able to locate um, the claimant in this other location. But we know, of course, with the internet and social media, it's becoming increasingly easier to, to, to find people um, online these days. And, the case law has established that you can't require a person to live in hiding in this proposed location um, for it to be safe. And you can't require that they break off communication with their family in order to remain safe in this proposed location. Um, then there's another part of the test for internal flight alternative. Let's say the decision maker decides your agent of persecution cannot find you in this city. Um, so I do think it would be safe for you but they can say it's not a viable internal flight alternative if there's other reasons that it would be unduly hard for that person to live there. So perhaps it's a city where um, people meeting the claimant's profile are severely discriminated against, for instance. Um, that might be a, a factor they consider. And then finally, um, implicit in the definition is that the, the fear is forward-looking. So it's not enough that someone's suffered persecution in the past. That might be a relevant factor in deciding whether that risk still exists in the future, but the test is, is forward-looking. So it's important to note that both international law, the convention and the protocol, as well as our Immigration Refugee Protection Act are, are quite limited in scope as to the definition of a refugee. So they don't include people fleeing famine, poverty, natural disasters, or even wars. So, well, but those factors would definitely be relevant in a determination of whether that internal flight alternative is viable, as I mentioned a moment ago. And a person fleeing a war could be a convention refugee if they also fear persecution based on one of the five grounds, but fleeing a war alone does not meet this definition.
So there is a second definition called person in need of protection and it's outlined at section 97 of our act. I've drawn out the key elements. Uh, Trying to advance the slide. What slide does it say, Manjan Paul? Protected persons. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. So you'll see similarities to the convention refugee definition, like the requirement to be outside of their country of nationality, that state protection is not available, that there is nowhere in their country they can live safely. But there's difference in the language in that there's the language is not well-founded fear of persecution, it's um, danger of torture or at risk of cruel or unusual treatment or punishment. And that's um, one of the key differences because without those words, well-founded fear, the requirement to establish subjective fear is removed. So remember I talked about the decision maker who will be considering any delays in claiming or failure to claim well, they will consider the claimant's uh, explanations for those delays, but if they do not accept those uh, explanations and, and find that the claimant lacks the requisite subjective fear, they can still accept a claim under this second definition. Um, another key difference is that the risk that the person faces doesn't have to be linked to one of those five grounds, race, religion, political opinion, nationality. Um, so an example, one that you might hear about a lot um, that, that would be considered under this second definition are victims of, of gang violence or crime. So think of um, the victims of gang violence from like the Northern Triangle countries, Honduras, Ecuador, sorry, not Ecuador, El Salvador, um, Guatemala. Um, if their claims were to succeed, it would be under section 97 because they don't have a nexus to a, a convention ground. Um, that's not, they're not being targeted by the gangs because of race, religion, nationality. But um, one thing they do have to show for their claim to be successful, it's not enough for them just to say, I come from a country where there's a lot of gang violence. It can't be a generalized risk. They have to show that it's personalized to them. If we go back to the slide, see the definition specifically has the word it would subject them personally to. So that's, so a lot of those claims can succeed if someone can establish with their evidence that they have actually been personally targeted or will be personally targeted by the gang. It's not enough to say um, there's a lot of gang violence or crime in our country. Um, Rebecca, we have a, an audience question. Are you good to take one? Sure. Okay. Um, Nat says, I'm always struck by the uh, large extent to which the regulatory regime around refugee uh, determination seems to presume a significant risk of abuse by claimants. If this is correct, is there any commensurate and objective basis for this or requirement that it be demonstrated by the government? Is there proof of the perceived risk? Um, so, sorry, I, I, I think I understand your question. Um, I mean, these problems that you're suggesting, I think personally um, started uh, under the you know, Harper government. <laughs> and um, there was a lot of, uh, you, you know, at that time they were using the term bogus refugee in the news a lot. It was also around the time that these two boats of a bunch of Thai, Tamil migrants showed up outside of Vancouver. So a lot of our discourse got for refugee claimants went really south around then, I think, um, but it has been improving. And ultimately the case law is very clear actually that um, you know, any testimony that they've sworn is presumed to be true. So that has to be the starting point for any decision maker, but then they can make negative credibility inferences during a hearing based on inconsistencies in their statements and, and their, you know, documentary evidence. And um, if those negative credibility inferences are kind of, they go to the central elements of the claim, then, then it can be rejected. So they are technically supposed to start with this um, belief that you're telling the truth. I find that that's often not the case when I'm appearing before some board members who um, have been around for a long time. And, and of course they have seen some claims that aren't grounded in truth, but they, that then they're not supposed to let that taint, you know, the next claim they determine, but it's, it's hard for them not to do that, I guess. I don't know if I really answered that question. 
Uh, I think you did, but if he has any follow-ups, he, um, he'll, he'll throw them in the chat to, to me, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you might think that this second definition is better because you don't have to have that tie to a convention ground, you don't have to show that subjective fear, but um, and it will capture more situations, but it's actually more difficult because to accept your a person's claim under this definition, um, the decision maker must be sat satisfied that it's more likely and not than not that the person would face this risk. So they have to establish their, their risk on a balance of probabilities, so more than 50%. But for a convention refugee, they just need to establish that there is a serious possibility they would face this risk. So it's less than 50%. Um, so it's always better to, if you're able to get nexus to a convention ground to, to put your claim forward under uh, the first definition. So I've prepared a little game. Um, it's a convention refugee, protected person, or neither. Um, I guess I'll just go through them because I can't actually see your comments, but I already mentioned the first one, fleeing from poverty, famine, and natural disaster. I, I already told you that that's um, not going to meet uh, either definition. Uh, protection is limited to those who face a specific risk not faced generally by others in the country. Um, so a claim based on a natural catastrophe will not satisfy the definition as the risk is generalized. Um, poverty too is not a ground for persecution, but if the poverty is systemic and can be linked to racism, for instance, it could then be considered as part of a potential cum cumulative consideration of discrimination and then the determination becomes whether it amounts to persecution. So, so poverty on it in itself, not a ground, um, but if, it, if you can have that connection to the convention ground, you can make the argument. War, as I mentioned, war or conflict on its own will meet neither definition, um, but again, you know, because, well, again, a risk uh, generalized to the entire population is usually not a basis for refugee protection unless they can establish that nexus to one of the, the five grounds. Um, a racial group is constantly being discriminated by civilians. They're refused employment, uh, refused uh, leasing an apartment. Uh, they file police reports. The police take the report, but nothing happens. So this situation, they do have a nexus to the first definition because it, you know, I mentioned it's a racial group, so they have the nexus to race. Um, and this would likely be a good case for cumulative discrimination amounting to persecution. Um, like I said, that often comes up with in the case law in a situation like the Roma, maybe in Hungary, and the courts have recognized that the educational um, employment, housing, economic and health barriers they face, as well as the anti-Roma violence can rise to the level of persecution. Uh, domestic violence, I mentioned um, that that will fall under um, a particular social group. So there is that nexus to section 96, the convention refugee definition. Uh, the Immigration and Refugee Board has actually published guidelines for claims where women uh, fear gender-based persecution. So that will include domestic violence, forced marriage, honor killings, um, female genital mutilation, and, and forced sterilization. Um, they've also published guidelines for claims based on sexual orientation and, and gender identity as well. Mandatory military service. So this is sort of both definitions or neither definition. It's an evolving area. Um, traditionally, we've recognized that it's not persecutory for a country to have mandatory military service. That said, um, claims can succeed if they can establish that they have a right to refuse to perform military service because of a genuine conviction based on religion or, or moral principles. So, you know, we call that conscientious objection. Um, or perhaps in cases where, you know, maybe they're not, there's not a genuine conviction with respect to all conflicts, but that person's genuinely opposed to a particular war because it violates international standards of law and human rights. Um, another way a claim could succeed with mandatory military services, even in, if the conscription itself has a legitimate or lawful purpose, 
if that conscription is con conducted in a discriminatory way or the punishment for desertion is biased in relation to one of the five convention grounds, then you could ground a claim that way. Um, Victims of gang violence, I already mentioned, um, they will only be able to succeed under the second definition and only if they can show that the risk is personalized to them. Uh, cannot receive medical treatment for a disease. So this is probably neither or potentially both with a little more information. Um, if the risk is caused by the inability of the country to provide adequate health care, then the claimant will not qualify for protection. Um, however, the inability of a country to provide adequate medical care generally has to be distinguished from situations where it is provided to some individuals, but not to others. So uh, individuals who are denied treatment may be able to establish a claim under um, the second definition if they can show the country's unwillingness is uh, it's an unwillingness, not an inability to provide the medication. And of course they can establish a definition, the first definition, if they can link the lack of medical treatment to a convention ground. Um, okay, so this one's interesting. So the police are seeking out a woman for participating in an illegal religion. They go to her home, question her husband. Um, woman is successful in her refugee claim. Could her husband also receive refugee protection? Um, so, and I guess I didn't make clear that he himself in this scenario doesn't um, have the religious uh, ties himself. So he can ground a claim in that first definition because there's another particular social group that's been developed in the case law that I haven't mentioned yet. And that's the particular social group of the family. But to be a member of that particular social group um, and to have the nexus to the convention ground, the principal family member, in this case, his wife, um, needs to have a nexus. And she does because she has the nexus to, to religion. So he can then have nexus to part the particular social group of the family. But if the wife's claim was not based on religion, but based on being a victim of, of gang violence, she doesn't have that nexus to that first definition, right? So while her claim could succeed under the second definition, he could not then himself ground a claim as a member of a particular social group of the family because she didn't have the nexus herself. That's a bit confusing. Maybe I'm getting too deep in the weeds here. Um, so the state believes an individual is a pro-democracy leader, even though that person does not support such views. So that person, yes, can, um, established nexus to the first definition convention refugee political opinion, even though they don't hold those views, because the courts have held that the, um, the real question is about what the agent of persecution perceives is the political opinion. So imputed political opinion will qualify. And then finally, a lesbian woman from a country where homosexuality is criminalized, but she could avoid punishment by keeping her relationship private. Um, yes, I've already mentioned this has a nexus to the first definition convention refugee because sexual orientation is, is recognized as a particular social group. And in terms of whether that's persecution, the court has held that, you know, the expectation that an individual should practice discretion with respect to her sexual orientation is perverse as it requires the individual to repress an immutable characteristic about themselves. So that was the game. Um, so how does someone make a refugee claim? Um, so there's two ways. There's the in Canada process and the out of Canada process. And what you hear about most of the time in the news is when you're hearing about Canada resettling, you know, thousands of Syrian refugees or Afghan refugees, you're, you're mostly hearing about this uh, resettlement program, the outside of Canada process. And that's what I'm going to talk about first. So for people seeking protection from outside of Canada, there are two classes. Um, there is uh, the one that sounds very similar to what the definition we just went over, the convention refugee class. So they're outside of their home country and they cannot return to their home country due to a well-founded fear of persecution based on the convention ground. But then there is also the country of asylum class. So for this class, they have to be outside of their home country and they have been seriously affected by civil war or armed conflict or have been denied human rights on an ongoing basis. So 
when we think about the crisis we've been seeing um, in recent years and how some of those people were resettled in Canada when they maybe didn't have an access to one of those five grounds, they would have come in through the country of asylum class. It's not defined in the legislation like those other two definitions I was going over earlier. It's defined in our regulations instead. And it says um, they're kind of, they're defined as a person in similar circumstances to those of a convention refugee. And the regulations outline that the criteria are that they have to be, as I just mentioned, um, seriously affected by a civil war. Um, so how does the process work with seeking protection from outside of Canada? Well, as I mentioned, um, they're outside of Canada, they're outside of their home country. Now they can either be sponsored by the federal government after the federal government has received a referral from the United Nations High uh, Commission for Refugees or from another designated referral agency. So the government works with different um, referral organizations, um, for instance, with Afghanistan for human rights defenders, they're, they're working with an organization called Frontline Defenders. For Afghan LGBTQ plus community, they've been working with Rainbow Railroad. And actually, you know, about a year ago now, uh, I assembled a team of 40 pro bono lawyers to assist with the applications of over 200 Afghan referrals made by um, Rainbow Railroad. And thankfully, many of them got here in time for Pride this past summer. Um, now, the other way is through a private sponsorship group like a group of five, and you might have friends who have done this, you know, in the past with, especially with, with uh, Syrian uh, refugees. Um, so in this case, they're not referred, they, they proactively submit their own application that's sponsored by a group of five individuals or a community sponsor group. Um, and in both cases, whether a referral or a private sponsorship, the individual has to have a recognition either from the UN Refugee Agency or the government of the third country that they are currently in, that they've been recognized as a refugee. Um, so that's a, a big requirement that has can be a real hurdle for a lot of people depending on that third country they're in because sometimes the UNHCR offices in that third country don't even issue those documents in that country. So um, in certain circumstances, the Canadian government has waived that requirement. So they did waive it for a few years for Syrian applicants, and they've recently waived it for uh, Afghan applicants as well. So it's a, it, that is a very good one big hurdle removed for them. Um, unlike inland um, refugee claimants, overseas uh, applicants have a few more obstacles that they have to deal with. Um, for one, they have to show that there's no reasonable prospect within a reasonable period of time of a durable solution in another country. So let's say you had a Syrian refugee who made it to Germany where they'd been recognized as a convention refugee, but they prefer to come to Canada because they speak English, not German, and their family members are in Canada. Those are obviously compassionate grounds, but they're not, you know, they're not going to be able to satisfy the Canadian government that they don't have a durable solution. In, in Germany, which is generally a, a pretty refugee friendly country and will give them probably a pathway to a more secure immigration status. The other thing that is harder about seeking protection from outside of Canada, you know, I don't mention it on the side, but there are financial settlement requirements. Um, just the very fact that they require a sponsorship you know, you know uh, either by the government or by the private sponsorship group, whereas inland claimants don't have to be sponsored by anyone. So that's another hurdle they face. Um, so for seeking protection from inside Canada, you can either do that at the port of entry, um, like an airport or a land border with the US, or you can um, submit a claim once you've maybe already entered on a visa or maybe entered irregularly. There are a number of situations where someone can't make a refugee claim, they're ineligible. Um, I know I, I'm not gonna go into any of these because I don't have a lot of time, but I am going to talk about one thing which you might've heard of is the Safe Third Country Agreement. Um, so it's an agreement between Canada and the US. Under this agreement, both countries recognize one another as a safe place for refugee claimants to seek asylum. And so they therefore bar 
refugee claimants at official land border crossings who have entered the other country first. Um, it only applies at land border crossings, so it doesn't apply at airports or seaports or inland offices. And that's why, unfortunately, you'll hear many times about people crossing irregularly into Canada rather than presenting themselves at the border um, because they know they'll be turned back to the US. Whereas if they cross irregularly and maybe get arrested once they've made it inside, um, they're not returned. They can stay and make their claim here. So it's a big incentive for them to do that. And sadly, you know, people have actually lost their lives doing that, you know, crossing over in Man Manitoba in the winter. Uh, it's very dangerous. Um, there are some exceptions to the agreement that would allow people to present themselves at the land border, such as if they have an eligible family member or um, unaccompanied minors, which are people under 18 who don't have either of their parents with them. The agreement is currently subject to a constitutional challenge um, based on the fact that many people who, were who get turned away after trying to make a claim at the Canadian border get almost immediately detained in the U.S. and, and the U.S. has a pretty bad immigration detention scheme. Also, certain refugee claims um, aren't recognized in, in the US. So they don't recognize domestic violence as a ground for a claim, for instance. And also the US has a rule where you have to make a claim within one year, otherwise you're barred from making a claim. So there's so if this person has been in the US for over one year, they can't even make a claim there, yet Canada is not going to let them come in. So there's all these reasons that it got challenged, and the federal court did find that it was unconstitutional. The federal court grounded that finding, particularly on the um, detention issue um, of these people being detained when they are returned back from Canada, and found that it implicated Section 7 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is our right to life, liberty, and security uh, per of the person. Um, the Federal Court of Appeal overturned that ruling, finding the agreement is unconstitutional. The Supreme Court of Canada took up the case. Oral arguments were presented in October, and a decision is still pending. So we'll see. Rebecca, I, I know you have a, a, a lot to cover, but I, yeah. I do want to just ask you, with the understanding that uh, the individual experiences of refugees very greatly. Uh, I was struck when you a couple of slides ago were talking about the port of entry and, and coming through an airport, arriving uh, by boat. Do you have a sense of what that experience of arrival is? I mean, you know, we have probably a pretty similar understanding of when we arrive at an airport uh, uh, as non-refugees ourselves, but through your work, what is that experience like of getting off a plane and having to find their way in many yeah. different ways? I honestly hear much better experiences at the land borders than I do at the airports. And I feel like that's my own experience too. I get so nervous approaching customs at the airport, uh, even as a Canadian citizen, I don't know why, but um, you know, the issue is a lot of my, a lot of my clients um, are aware they don't have to make a claim at the airport. And after having just been on a 12 hour flight or something like that, you know, with a two year old child who threw up all over them, you know, like they'd rather just come in on the visa that they have, mm -hmm. settle, settle in, find a lawyer who can help them. But the problem is, is then you get peppered with all these questions by the CBA, a CBSA officer, and eventually, you know, they get pushed into a situation of, making that claim at the airport when they just were not prepared to do that. And um, they interview them and that whole transcript ends up being part of the record of their refugee claim. But like I said, they're just out off of a really long flight, super tired, you know, if they don't speak English and then they, the CBSA arranges an interpreter by the phone, which is not ideal. So these interviews always have just so many mistakes that we then have to fix when we're writing out the story. So. Yeah, it's it's very stressful. I do think the the land border um, way is 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 quite nice actually. <laughs> you can make an appointment for like when you want to come and make the claim, um, and there's organizations along the border that will help refugee claimants make those appointments. So um, I think it's preferable. But <laughs> thanks for that. Yeah. Um, so other remedies um, that exist. Um, for claimants. So, you know, I didn't go into detail, but I told you about people who might not be eligible for refugee claims. 
Um, so those people might will then have access to something called a pre-removal risk assessment. So they still do get a risk assessment, but it's not as good as a refugee claim because the refugee claim is um, determined by the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada, which is an independent body. Um, the pre-removal risk assessment is determined by Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. So it's like the gatekeeper is the one determining uh, the claim. And so that's already you know, not as uh, fair. Also the refugee claim, you get a full hearing. The pre-removal risk assessment is a paper-based process. So also less fair in terms of the right to be heard. Um, people can also apply for an application to remain in Canada based on humanitarian and compassionate grounds. Uh, so a decision maker can look at any number of humanitarian and compassionate factors, such as the best interests of any children affected by the application, the applicant's level of establishment in Canada, family and community ties in Canada, uh, hardship in the country of origin. Um, and it's not the same as a risk assessment. They can just consider, you know, country conditions generally. It doesn't have to be personalized to the person. Um, and then from time to time, the government offers a number of special programs or measures. So you might have read about during the pandemic, they introduced a program for frontline healthcare workers for and even failed refugee claimants could qualify for that. And then another example would be some of the special measures they've introduced for Ukraine, which I'm going to go into more detail about now. Um, okay, so First, there's this emergency travel authorization. So Canada created this measure to help Ukrainians come uh, as temporary residents and to provide them with the authorization to work and study while in Canada. Um, so Ukrainian nationals can apply for this online and they get priority processing above you know, people applying for visas from any other country. Uh, and the program will allow them to stay in Canada for up to three years, but they can also apply to extend that stay once the three years is coming to an end. Um, they've also, Canada's also offered uh, increased newcomer services for Ukrainians. They've waived application fees. They've chartered flights and entered into um, partnerships with organizations to donate travel points and cash to support flights for Ukrainians. Um, people who are sponsoring Ukrainian family members um, are given priority processing, but the family members still have to fit into one of the the classes for family sponsorship. So a spouse, common law partner, conjugal partner, or dependent child, it can't be just any relative. Um, the Immigration and Refugee Board also prioritizes Ukrainian files right now, but this represents a small proportion of their files because they're, they're mostly doing refugee claims and refugee appeals, right? And as you know, Ukrainians will only meet the definition if they can also establish a link to a convention ground. So it's not gonna be enough for them at the Immigration Refugee Board to, um, to, to say I'm fleeing a conflict. Um, the government also announced an administrative deferral of removals to Ukraine. So this is a temporary measure that Canada puts in place when immediate action is needed to temporarily defer removals to countries facing humanitarian crises. So there's one in place for Ukraine, um, actually, Canada recently, more recently, put one in place for, for Iran. Um, there are some exceptions to this rule. Some people may still be removed to these countries if they are inadmissible on very serious grounds like security, organized crime, or international or human rights violations. Okay, so um, since February 2022, almost 5 million Ukrainians have fled the country and obviously millions or more are displaced within the country. Um, this is this chart reflects Canada's intake in comparison to other countries. We obviously see the top three are Poland, Germany and the Czech Republic, um, which received as of September um, 1.4 million, 1 million and uh, 400,000 respectively. Uh, like in Canada, many of these uh, neighboring states in the European Union have removed complex procedures to facilitate faster reception of those fleeing uh, Ukraine. So I'll just skip ahead to Canada's numbers. So as of November 27th, um, Canada has had eight, over 18,000 Ukrainians arrived by land and over 100,000 arrived by air. And for that emergency travel authorization, they've received over 700,000 applications and they've so far approved over 400,000. 
But here I have a chart representing the number of international displaced persons by country of origin. I include this because there have been concerns surrounding this flexible approach taken by Canada and you know, these uh, European Union countries as compared to their responses to other humanitarian crises around the world. Um, you know, they both Canada and the European Union have removed normally complex procedures that hinder the speedy processing of, of applications um, from other applicants, non-Ukrainian applicants. Canada and other crises normally has a cap on the number of people they'll accept um, that we will resettle like from Syria and Afghanistan, but there's no cap on any of the Ukrainian programs they've announced. And they've reduced the documentation requirements for the issuance of the, the visa for Ukraine. So in comparison, since, since August 2021, when the Taliban took over in Afghanistan, Canada has received 25,400 refugees from Afghanistan and pledged to welcome at least 40,000 refugees and vulnerable Afghans. Um, so the, this data is as of December. Um, we've so far welcomed 9,000 uh, through the special program for people who assisted the government of Canada. Um, for the humanitarian program for the most vulnerable groups like the LGBTQ uh, community, human rights defenders, women leaders, journalists, um, and the, all of those ones to fit in this group, you have to have been referred by the UN Refugee Agency or frontline defenders or project defenders. So we've received almost 15,000. Um, the special program to sponsor, uh, oh no, sir, actually first there's, there's another program for extended family members of former interpreters, so 670 there. And then the special program to sponsor Afghan refugees who don't have that refugee de status designation from either the UN Refugee Agency or the third country that they're in. Um, we've already reached the cap of 3,000 applicants, but I don't know how many have actually arrived yet. Um, so this data is from October 2020, um, available on the Government of Canada website, but it indicates that since November 2015, so about a five-year period, Canada resettled 44,620 Syrian refugees um, through the Syrian Refugee Resettlement Initiative. So it's just sort of a striking difference there that we had 44,000 Syrians resettled in Canada in a five-year period, whereas we've already welcomed over 100,000 Ukrainians in less than a year. Um, but Canada's approach to these crises is evolving. So, you know, they learned a lesson with Syria that it made things easier um, if they waived that requirement to have the uh, refugee designation from the UN Refugee Agency or the third country. Um, so more recently, they did they did that again for Afghan Afghan applicants to make things easier for them because getting that designation really does prove to be a big hurdle for a lot of applicants. But Canada's response to the Ukrainian crisis is, is unprecedented. Um, specifically, rather than the resettlement processes that we've seen for Syria and Afghanistan and other conflicts, which would lead to a permanent status and therefore require all sorts of admissibility checks. Um, what Canada has done with Ukraine is offered temporary applications which allows the applications to be processed much more quickly and flexibly. And traditionally, Canada's approach to issuing temporary resident visas has been conservative, where there's evidence that the individual may not leave Canada at the end of their uh, authorized stay. So typically, a person from a war-torn country would have a lot of difficulty getting a temporary resident visa to Canada because the officer would doubt that they would return at the end of their stay. But this program has essentially done away with the requirement for the immigration officer to be satisfied the Ukrainian national has a temporary intent. Whereas imagine an Afghanistan citizen right now trying to get a temporary resident visa, the officer would have to be satisfied that they would return to Afghanistan at the end of their stay. And that's kind of satisfying an immigration officer of that right now is sort of an impossible hurdle. So by handling uh, the crisis in Ukraine through this temporary program rather than some of the resettlement programs um, that they've done with other crises in the past and, and doing away with this requirement of a temporary intention, Canada was able to much more quickly process these applications and get large numbers of Ukrainians here much more quickly. 
Um, so it's shown what, what Canada is really capable of, and it'll be interesting to see how they will respond to future crises. Um, you know, we've just discussed Ukraine, Syria, and Afghanistan today because those are, you know, hot in the media and, and we know Canada's responses to them. But what about other crises uh, around the world that Canada hasn't implemented special measures for? You know, what about Yemen, for instance, or numerous uh, uh, neglected humanitarian crises in Sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council publishes a list of the top 10 most neglected displacement crises in the world. And the top 10 right now are all in Africa, but nobody uh, talks about it. They receive little political response, little media attention, little funding. So I don't know, I guess my thesis is there's just a lot to be done. And uh, I think that's, that's it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Rebecca. I really appreciate that, that contrasting at the end, uh, which leads me to, uh, a question that I had, what would you like to see from the government? And then I think for us in the legal sphere, what would you like to see the legal profession uh, do in this area of, of law? What are kind of heading into 2023? Uh, if you wanna state any wishes from those two big bodies, what would, what would they be? Oh, I don't know. I have so many wishes for from immigration right now um and it doesn't just have to do with how they're responding to these crises um because even before ukraine i mean ircc was just so slow in everything they do um anytime i sent a any kind of request for something on a file um they i'd get this automatic response saying we're really busy with afghanistan right now but as we know like they really, just, I don't think they have done enough <laughs> with Afghanistan as when you compare it to what they've done for Ukraine. So, but they, they were happy to use the, the, the excuse <laughs> to, to not respond to our request. But I would just, I mean, Afghanistan, it's still ongoing. So I would like to see, and, and there's all these other conflicts. So I would like to see them introduce more flexibility in those situations like they have with Ukraine. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of political will behind their response to Ukraine that unfortunately is not there for other crises, I guess. I think that's really honest and fair, so thank you. Um, okay, we only actually have time for, for one more question. There was another question in the chat about the, the PowerPoint presentation. We will confer with Rebecca and uh, a follow-up uh, email with any kind of resources uh, will be sent up uh, after this presentation, so thank you for that question, Basma, and uh, we have an anonymous question uh, for our last one. How are the adjudicators trained and selected? Um, so more, I, we just actually, I was at a uh, law society event where the, the board was, um, the panelists were from the board and they were telling us about their training. Actually, um, they were telling us about the trauma training they just received from another person, the mother of another person that Jean-Paul and I went to high school with, which I'll tell you about after. But she's also an expert in, in trauma-informed um, refugee adjudication. So I know they, they are making a lot of efforts to understand, you know, in the past, they'd make all these negative credibility determinations, not really understanding the social science and, you know, scientific evidence behind trauma and how it affects memory. Um, and so they are receiving a lot more training in that. In terms of how they are selected, um, so there, you know, there's two ways. There's a government, there's an application process, and, and I think you have to ha show that you have either how, however many years presenting claims or however many years um, determining claims or in a decision-making role, maybe with another tribunal. Um, but then there's also political appointments. Um, and unfortunately, there's still quite a few board members, decision makers at the tribunal that are political appointments from, from that old area that I was talking about. Um, so it is, uh, I really, when I walk into a hearing, well, I don't walk in, I log in now, but, and I see, I have that decision maker, you know, I just start preparing for the appeal basically, <laughs> because yeah, they, they are the, just, their mindset is to disbelieve anything coming out of, of the claimant's mouth, unfortunately. 
Well, uh, that's uh, disheartening to hear, but uh, so glad that you are someone there to counteract that, Rebecca. Um, so thank you for sharing uh, this uh, presentation with us and your deep well of knowledge on this, you know, uh, really quite tricky uh, area of law uh, with a lot of misconceptions abounding. Um, so thank you for clarifying and expanding all of our knowledge. Um, and uh, I know the audience uh, echoes that uh, warm reception. So thanks so much, Rebecca, and thanks to you all for attending. Look for new programming in 2023 and happy holidays uh, to all those uh, joining us and watching this afterwards. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you for having me.